sweet sister. This is Dio, mommy, who you embraced so many years ago. I've spoken to my life when I had no mother because my parents were divorced from the time I was seven. And I came into University of Ibadan and I was a confused young lady. I was a jambite without direction. Mommy, you saw something in me. You, Professor Mommy Ogunyemi, Professor Isidro Obeo, Professor Dani Zebai, Professor Dapade Luba, then Dr. Harry Garuba. I saw in you, like I saw in Mama Ogieni, something that gave me my northern star. A question was asked by Reverend Dr. James Ngai. The question, how can a girl child be repositioned when her background was shambled? Welcome to such a girl child as this. And I am still a girl child in process. My prayer is, may I never lose the girl in me. Because you see, you need that girl. You need her to become the full expression of the innocence that must never leave you. Because captured in that innocence are the dreams and aspirations that will always direct you and lead you. I'd like to use this opportunity to properly honor and welcome, recognizing the chief host, vice chancellor of the University of Ibadan, here in his representation and in her own capacity, the DVC professor, Ola Nike Adeyemo. Please help me appreciate it. <laughs> Policy will not amount to anything until we change the way we do and see our things. And handling the gender lens challenge, like you said, and the profiling that happens when we stand to speak, may we understand that as women that we were first created, you are distinct and distinguished when you carry what is woman in you to a place of distinctivity for your time, your calling, your profession, and your cadre of reference. I would like also to honor here properly the host of the Institute of, our uh, host and the director, Institute of African Studies, Dr. O. I. Hoxon, represented by Dr. I. A. Jimon. The question of genderism in service and development. A question with many answers, because just like the marketplace and the market, there are many ways to enter the market. So the real business of coming into the marketplace is what are you transacting and how are you transacting for it? Who are you transacting with? From both of us, thank you very much. He's no longer here. But the question resonates, the statement resonates. Men and women, let us walk and work together. Appreciating also, my friend, the National Program Officer for UN Women, Patience Akiova, representing our special guest of honor, Madam Comfort Lamte. All of my distinguished co-presenters, of which we have listened to Hannah Schlingman and Oluwakemi Ademola Aremo. 
There is more that shall be heard today. But now, to the business, the transaction of this discussion and our keynote. I've not come to you as a professor, but I do here also want to properly acknowledge the distinguished academia that are here seated. And members, my sisters, because I hope to be part of that very unique group of the Institute of Gender Studies. Let me appreciate Dr. Sheolu Tayo and her assistant, Helena Fabio. Because even though they've given me that lofty introduction and saying a woman who has everything and therefore can represent and speak on this discussion, the truth of the matter is just a woman who had a conversation and she heard certain things and then threw me the gauntlet and said, you are coming to speak the keynote. A nation's culture resides in the heart and soul of its people, Mahatma Gandhi said. And I have come up with another quote that says this, that a nation's future resides in the heart and the soul of her mothers. Those who will do more than others are mothers. And I say this not because being a mother is biological, what we are packaged to be or because you have a child or you don't have a child or you're yet to have a child no I say this because woman was created as a matrix by which that which as a seed placed in her womb will produce generations after her so the call of motherhood however wherever we are is distinct to every one of us once you are born woman you are a nurturer influencer community mobilizer you are the one who brings change where you are to the matrix that has been packaged in you from your cortex to the place of your packaging pure water. A woman's emotional intelligence, not her emotional semantics, is what gives her her positioning and distinction. Just like we heard the DVC say, she's not here because she's the only woman DVC on the lineup. No, she was the best person chosen for this assignment. Simple. Well, she didn't put it in that language. But clearly articulated by the MC, she is a voice that this context and environment loves to hear resonate. What is the culture transformational in repositioning women in service and development? When you position a woman who has activated the DNA of mothering a nation, an institution, a corporate entity, an idea, an innovation, then you find the power of her profundity expressed, not just for her gender, but for her nation, her community, and her society. As my historical abstract, I know some of us have the read in your hands. I want to first establish that the vital personality of our discussion here today is none other than a persona. A persona. She's not real, but she exists in reality. The African woman. An institutional representation that embodies a continent and its history, as well as diaspora and contemporary expressions. More than a gender, she's an entity. The personification of the African woman and the plethora of conversations, one of this, around her is pivotal to the evolution of the global African ethos and its prodigious identity as so succinctly captured in a profiling in the recent all-black cast Hollywood box office hit, The Black Panther. You can still put that picture up there. In the words of the character Okoye, the lead general commanding the exclusive all-female army of the king of Wakanda. Wakanda being that utopian and mystical African civilization as featured in the film. She says, have you said Chimamanda? Please go back. Thank you. Even though she's a Wakanda, everybody say Wakanda. 
But she's not the one right back, the very first one. Just the open. In that which is family and friendship and love. And this was her statement. I am loyal to the throne no matter who sits there. She did not separate herself from the place of her assignment and her service. And this statement, in my capture, is a radical depiction of the true calling and heart of service of the African woman, wherever you find her. That is why Oprah Winfrey may never have come to your own hometown and mine. But what she represents globally is not just a voice in America. It's not just the voice of a black African woman. She represents the voice of woman in a generational translation across tribe, race, genders, and ages. Regardless of her multi-purpose, repurposed identity and history through horrific experiences from traditional patriarchy to female genital mutilation, Badagri slave ships, West Indian planting, plantation slavery, bestial colonizations, South Africa's apartheid, Rwandan genocide, political invasions, all these are experiences the woman has gone through, marginalization, and the now pervasive classification of her, our African woman pedigree as a third class citizen, poverty afflicted denigrate, dismal statistic on the United Nations Convention of the Status of Women World Chart. She is still African woman, unbreakable. Throughout history, the enigma of the African woman has remained unchanged, classified as preserver and nurturer of legacies and dynasty of Africa. She is without question the quintessential prima donna, Mother Africa. We've just celebrated a mother here. And the spirit, espiritus of motherhood, as I have translated it, more than others in her capacity to deliver service and express true development. Beyond her revered status, status quo, Mother Africa both owns and defines social cultural reality, dynamics and diversity of the identities of the contemporary African woman, all of us here seated, in our critical assignments and varied roles in service and development. Whatever the subsector of her, of our professional, institutional, or vocational cater. Today I've stepped into this room, an entrepreneur, a speaker, a multifaceted representation of everything I have graduated as from the Department of English of the University of Ibadan. I found in myself expressions in that multi-varied positioning that I never knew I had in me. I never understood that I had that profundity of excellence when it comes to delivering service, no matter what my appointed task or assignment is. Regardless of generational timelines, the centrality of her position as an established perception has ensured the survival and stability of the African ethos worldwide. Wherever you find her, being Mother Africa, being expressed in her full integrity, you will find a moral compass a unique entrepreneurial DNA, generational imprint, a bridge builder, and an influencer of unborn generations. African Woman is a holistic study of the African economy from rural to global. Because when we contemplate it, who worked the farms while carrying the babies on their backs? Who carried the produce from the farm to the marketplace? Who created market days in Nigeria? Who created the grid? of the African economic matrix, African woman. So she's a holistic study of our African economy, from that which is rural to that which is global. Today, the Nigerian woman entrepreneur has become a supermodel of enterprise, of global representation and reference. Wherever you find the Nigerian woman entrepreneur, she evolved just from wanting to take care of her household, multitasking, while she goes to school to teach. She's making sure she's packaging little moi moi 
little water. She's doing something. That is enterprise. It started there, but today, what do we have? Incredible women sitting on the board of First Bank. Who am I talking about? But she started as a carpenter. Who am I talking about? Yes. I had to take some time to go and sit with her, just 15 minutes. I didn't know her personally, but I realized as an influencer, she has become a mentor. Please understand, a mentor is not necessarily someone you must meet. Just someone you must pattern your style of delivery of excellence as you follow through. And should the opportunity one day arise that you meet them, that is an aha moment. In a subliminal context, the African woman entrepreneur, professional, academia, is a faculty of integration on any subject matter relating to service and development, both for the continent and her specific geopolitty, much more than a keynote speech. She's a lifetime study, an ever-evolving curator of African society, humanity, economy, and community. I am privileged to stand here today and speak as her daughter, with her voice, from her womb, expressing her thoughts in words which she, as a true mother of pure inspiration, has spoken to my ears, whispered to my heart, beating with her blood that calls for the redemption of Africa and Africa's truest sons and daughters. Now, the contemporaries. There are many ways I could have gone with this discourse. But I decided not to come the way of the academia. I decided to come the way my friend Patience has articulated for me and told me, just come the way as a practitioner from your place of endeavor. So while I celebrate our years, mommy from Elia Ransom Kuti, and Margaret Echo, and mommy, um, um, Guaba, I want you to understand that today I am coming from the place and position where I have engaged this in contemporary experience. A lot of people ask me, how do you do what you do? Well, they have to come to UI first to find out in a collateral expression. However, in sincerity, it has taken a great grace of God, a place of faith, Every woman standing better have her position of faith articulated strong. It has also taken courage over confidence because I realize we can go out and say, oh, she's very confident. No, I'd like to submit to every one of you here today. Remember, I took my first gasp of nervous breath. I think I'll take another of two here. <laughs> More than being confident. It's just courage. And courage for every woman here, understand. And everyone here, courage is not the absence of fear. That which will come to intimidate you will stand there like a Goliath to face you. But stand. Stand knowing you have the understanding and the grit and the guts to go through. So there's a whole quotation there that was taken from the Beijing statement of Her Excellency the then First Lady of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mrs. Mariam Sami Abacha, when she led the delegation to the Beijing World Conference in 1995. This statement is 23 years old. And in that statement are four germane issues. I don't want to take you through the entire statement. But the emphasis is gender perspectives, global issues, unique concerns and priorities, and access to development opportunities. These were four statements embedded in a 23-year-old statement by our then First Lady, who went to the Beijing conference. And let me use this opportunity now. I know in Nigeria, we have a very significant resentment of wifeism. Women who are married to men of political influence opposition that now set up programs and projects in 
the name of being the wife of either the president, the governor, and so on. And there's a lot of resentment about this. But I would like to state here categorically that nowhere else in the world does wifeism do what it does in this country for community. Nowhere else. You may condemn it and call it what you want. It's only because nobody has taken on the charge to give it an interpretation and not demonize it. Yes, she may not have spoken it with the kind of clarity of English that maybe someone like Auntie Dio or Dio would have done. But am I the wife? Are you the wife? Do you have the opportunity? And were you there? Do you know what she sacrificed to become and stay the wife of this entity who now has political influence? Wifeism in Nigeria needs to be captured and properly articulated by the academia. When we talk about gender perspectives, I have given it a reference, the Chimamanda Challenge. Global issues, gender equality versus gender equity. I'm going to come to these as terms. Unique concerns and priorities, the hashtag Me Too syndrome. Access to development opportunities about wealth creation vis-a-vis -vis poverty alleviation. New appraisals and new paradigms so that we can close education, political, and economic gaps. And I put here, for the purpose of the fact that this, I know in its literary context, is going to be captured, I have put here already that, please, may I humbly insert that these four keynote outlooks are in no way a thesis on the subject matter, only a summary of my personal contemplations and introspective reviews. So I take responsibility. And these are not conclusive in themselves, but are deliberately aimed at you to rearticulate and reset your mindset on the subject matters of positioning women in service and development here in Nigeria, from the Academia of the Institute of Gender Studies, from this place of global positioning by these statements to the rest of the world. It says, and I go on to say that all of these subject matters, I believe, will be more inherently discussed in the course of today and tomorrow. So let's start with the Chimamanda challenge. Belling the cat has never been a celebrated assignment for anyone. Students, do you know the story of belling the cat? Who will bell the cat? Do you know? You don't know? In summary, let me just put it like this. There's a story told of a cat that kept on terrorizing the rats. You heard the story of the rat already. Who used wisdom to have the mouse trap destroyed? Well, it's a story. These rats have a very important place in all of this commentary here today, obviously. And so it is that they decided that the best thing is if someone could put a bell on the cat, we would always know when the cat comes with its stealth moments to attack and capture one of us. But the big problem became, who would bell? Thank you. So belling the cat has become now an expression that simply means when you have to bring attention to something that may have certain implications, you end up being implicated, being me. So I put it here, belling the cat has never been a celebrated assignment. While the intent is always to turn the tidal affront from a flood of imminent destruction to a flow of actionable solutions, it always primarily implicates the rat who deterred to rat attack. Today, I, Dio Benjamin Slani, am that rat. A rat with two bells and two cats. Indeed, a case of double jeopardy. One cat, is Chimamanda. The other cat is you, the academia. 
Africa in recent times has witnessed the emergence of her Amazons. Women stepping beyond the boundaries of restrictive culture. Women casting off the cloak of patrilineal imposition and stereotypes. Waking confidently into the spotlight of business and enterprise. Literary genius, science, technology. Women who are reshaping and redefining roles and enshrined, enshrined tasks that have been the exclusive male preserve. Women with attitude with male affronting swag, and dare I say it, Beijing women, as popularized in slogan, with particular reference to Nigeria by men and women, challenged then, post Beijing, by the emergence of a new kind of Nigerian feminine consciousness, which propelled Nigerian feminism in the workplace and diametrically opposed every traditional confinement of her capacities and limitation of her potentials in the place of equal opportunity. In more recent times, we have experienced the rise and rise of the millennial girl child bloggy. From an internet to an internet diva, social media paragon. From pouts on Instagram and sweet tweets to professional branding, CVs and her personal image statements. Now enter Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. From the blooming of a purple hibiscus, to the now booming broadcast of I am feminist. She also says that many men, many women are stronger than men after all. Mm? I'm coming. I'm glad that I had someone who kind of spiced it ahead of time with my positional statement, DVC. When it comes to gender perspective, truth is, no one is projecting it louder than our girl, Chimamanda, right now. She's young, defiant, Nigerian, brilliant, erudite, celebrated, even venerated by some visibly global and feminist. Chimamanda is in our face, in your face, with a query in her tone that asks you, ask me, what are you going to do about it? Confidently confronting cultural precepts, even daring the thing around our necks. This thing around our necks, you see, on Sunday, I heard a man confront one of our distinguished guests, one of the board of directors of the International Press Institute at a private luncheon. He's someone we know. He said, This Chimamanda girl, she's our daughter and she's out of order. How can she? Now he came from a very specific angle, that of religion, the Roman Catholic reference. How can she compare the communion to the offerings of our traditional priests? This is, it was like, in fact, what he went on to say, I refuse to repeat. But clearly, I now saw another dimension. It's like, our daughter has gone mad. <laughs> this Oyibo culture has changed the head of a brilliant Onsuka girl to a query. She's in her face. What is this thing around our necks, I now ask? Around our minds, our perceptions, our tradition, particularly our patriarchy, that makes us view Chimamanda as colonized, not colonized, but colonized, by her diaspora exposure. Too much book or ITK, I too know syndrome. Whatever it is, I have come with a charge for us today that demands that we meet the Chimamanda challenge. So what is the Chimamanda challenge? You see, the truth is, Chimamanda is what she is. Positioned where she is, doing what she's doing. Recently in North America, she was confronted by someone who said, how dare you come and stand up and talk to us about feminism when you haven't handled the issue of female genital mutilation? And everybody was, exactly. And she calls herself out. This is the real issue. It's the real issue, but it's not Chimamanda's issue. Why must you classify her by your issue? Will you tell William Shakespeare to say what Margaret Thatcher is saying? 
If feminism is her track, then let her keep with it. But the truth is, and when I say this now, you're going to see where I'm going. Chimamanda is young. She's where she is. But there's an African proverb that tells us that the child who stands on top of the highest, let me put it ladder, seeing far, cannot see what mama, mama emeritus, sitting down here, without looking where he's looking, has seen. But she's on a journey. We're all on a journey. And when you're on your journey, you find that you have a different tone, language, expression, belief, communication, dialogue, and warfare. Chimamanda's own right now. I hear that she didn't play down the fact that being pregnant, she said, overrated. Nobody needed to know when she was pregnant, when she just came out and she said, breastfeeding mom. That's the first time the world had the impact of knowing she was mommy. She's like, why overdo it? Chimamanda. <laughs> so the challenge is there. But in this workspace of literary review, what is your service call? It is to take what we term as our negative views and turn them into positive round table discussions. Chimamanda has brought to our face the realities of those things that we have so easily panned as our culture. It's time to interpret what we call culture into what must become a contemporary assignment. Please, everything in modern creation and innovation goes through new improved models, very simply cars. Even our being woman and feminist must go from one level to the next. Let us critically appraise and rephrase, rehearse and retool her language and defiant communication to shape policies and interventions for Nigeria, for African children, for African girl child and sons alike. Activism and aesthetics, not just for the girl child, but for our sons too. I, Dayo, Benjamin Zlani, standing before you here. I'm a mother of four children, three sons and one daughter. My oldest son is 21, then 18, then 16, and my baby girl is 13. Some people ask me, how did I have them? I coughed them out. <laughs> <laughs> Humorous as it may sound, I would rather propose that while I raise my daughter to be feminine, fearless, and fulfilled, not 15 ways to be a feminist, I choose to raise my sons as quote unquote feminist, meaning I would rather raise sons who have the real courage to stand out as men while standing up to celebrate women as distinct in gender, but co-equal in opportunity. Yes, that is my punchline. Distinct in gender. Let the sons be distinct as men and the daughters distinct as women, but let the opportunities be equal. I don't agree with the statement that what a man can do, a woman can do better. It has created too much bitterness and division in the humanity that we are supposed to cohesively create. MC, how did you put it? You talked about a social reconstruct between men and women. There was something you said. Gender, well, cheese resentment, let me just end that. Towards chivalry, the word chivalry, C-H-I-V-A-L-R-Y, is not chivalry, chivalry. As a classification of male chauvinism must be corrected. The only thing common in them is the way they sound at the point of takeoff. Chivalry, chauvinism. Chivalry and chauvinism are not cousins in semantics or morphology or syntax for that matter. 
Chivalry is also not a dirty word for sleazy guys who set women up to exploit them, but rather a laudable term of heroic and not a cake reference for men like my sons and my husband, I dare say, who celebrate women to become the full expression of all they are created to be. When it comes to the issues, global issues, I want to take on this context of gender equality versus gender equity. It's the terms of reference. And that, again, reflects on what I said. Women as distinct in gender, but co-equal in opportunity. Gender is what we are distinctly created as. No matter how transgenderized this present society and medical innovation may attempt to repurpose the human species, we can only be transgenderized so far. The best attempts may even put a womb in a man and semen in a woman, but no scientific dimension can activate the software or creative capacity of a man impregnating and a woman and a woman conceiving a pregnancy. Even if they've managed to surgically, medically create this outlook of a man with a womb, it cannot carry, it cannot conceive a baby. There is no anointing oil. The real challenge, therefore, is not a gender equality issue. Please remember, these are my personal perceptions and views. As pertaining to our sexes, but a gender equity contention as pertaining equal opportunities. Why I'm saying this is, the language and the positioning has become so contentional right now that we really need as academia as a present generation of women of influence to choose how we are going to rephrase these things and don't be intimidated by the fact that the convention on status of women is 62 years old Maybe it's 62 years old so that you, who are 13, can come up with a language that turns it around so we can work together and not apart. I'm not calling for utopia. But I am, I am proposing that there be a correction. What is out of alignment is out. In political space, many people are demanding that they want women to come in. They should give us, the men are not going to give way. But there is a retooling, a strategic innovation way that we as women together can begin to rearticulate our position in that space. They don't have to like us, but they can respect us and give us what is ours if we move into policy, shaping the activism that puts voice, not just in votes and your plastic voters card, but in the National Assembly, on the social media platforms that we are truly able to engage and re-articulate our position as one of opportunity. I don't want to be, I don't need to be better than you. I am who I am and I'm the best. Being woman is not something I have to compete to be. It's not something I have to prove to be. If you look at me, you know I am woman. Let us therefore consolidate our position. Let me just go back. I propose here as women the need to change our tone and reframe the context of our communication from agitation to innovation. We are already aware of what we are. We are women. Let us therefore consolidate our positions from a place of heightened insight and gender maturity as we embrace this position of influence for real impact as women on the world stage. I believe we must replace the wrath, anger, brawn for brawn match. Many women are stronger than men, right, in fighting. Have you seen a woman engage in a fight with a man? What does it look like? It looks like the end of the world. It looks like it should look wicked. And the same thing, when a man passes on a woman, either to rape or attack her, 
intimidate, molest her. Please, I'm not making excuses for the men because I've been privileged to marry. And I, and I don't believe, like I said, I'm, I'm married to one man who is just one out of 1,000 generations. No! There are enough. Enough around us. Enough with us. We too must understand that we have become what we are in our tone and our attitude because we have not matured in the true love of embracing our humanity that is greater than our gender position. So let us replace the rough anger brawn for brawn match with our elegance and femininity as we focus on remodeling for the opportunities we seek. Our level and quality of mental, emotional, and spiritual preparation must become heightened, purposeful, and remodeled, producing a collective re-strategized agenda which the contemporary, which contemporary humanity and future societies will embrace and give women their space and unique positions, not as an act of tokenism, but as a matter of human dignity and our woman right. I dare say a woman's right is, dis right is distinct and separate from her human right. And I love to say this, a woman's first human right are her happy rights. When you have happy women, you have healed societies. The tragedy of our present opportunity will be that we did not make ourselves ready. God forbid. When it comes to matters of unique concerns and priorities, I have put focus on the hashtag MeToo syndrome. This is the loudest clamor in our gender space at the moment, one which has brought center stage the trauma of sexual abuse and denigration of women in this generation. As vocal stages of affinity are being created, the festering traumas and abuses that had been concealed by decades of repressed stigmatization and fear of ostracism by victims is now spewing out with the force of volcanic wrath, rage, and screams of gender injustice. I guess all of those words simply show I went to the Department of English of the University of Ipano. <laughs> Women are angry. They are wearing pink, holding up the placards, and they are mad. These are our unique concerns. Voices of our daughters and sisters must be owned as our own and addressed as such. Women must heal women. Women must heal women. Enough said, women are their own worst enemies. May I propose one truth I found? Women are their own best friends. Today, I have, yes, let's celebrate on it. I know you may, it may challenge you and say, hmm, my mom-in-law is not my best friend. <laughs> but that's because you as a daughter-in-law have not positioned her to be that. I'm here today with an older, bigger, sister, woman friend. She is about 12 years older than I am. And she's Dr. Dayakusa, retired director from the Institute of Peace and Conflict Resolution in Abuja. What would make a mama like her follow me? True friendship to encourage me, to strengthen me. As she sits in that row, it gives me strength, encouragement. Yes, she has critiqued what I did here. You see, there's a way in which when you're doing a keynote, you arrange you put, and say, okay, amen. When I go to the gender and I learn how to do those things, I will do them properly. But for the moment, like I said, please accept me as I am. And once again, help me appreciate Dr. Dayo I don't know who's a friend here in the room for you. If you don't have one, you just don't have one yet. Friends you are looking for begin with you. Be a friend. So women must heal women. I would like to say that we must integrate our collective and individual gender expressions. As practitioners in our different professional spaces, as academia or entrepreneurs, every one of us represents a critical capacity 
and there can be no development until service, the capacity in us is translated as service in all that we do. When we do that with service, we have platforms, positions, and paradigms. Uh, if you are looking for it, that came from inner space, just as I was coming this morning. So I would have to include it, you can see it here, later on in my capture. But with service, we have three Ps, platform, position, and paradigms. With your platform, make declarations. Determine who it's to, what it's for, why, and how, and then go ahead and do it. With your positions, become an influencer, set trends, effect changes. Determine social behavior by repurposing and repatterning yours. We are boots on the ground and heels six inch in traction whenever we are redesigning policy for polity. And then when we look at the paradigm, let us restructure, mobilize, collaborate, create events and panels, discussions like this, little home groups, conversations, carry our synergy forward to confront the issues of this timeline. The psychology of service, the power of that psychology is in the word itself, like an acronym. S, selflessness and sacrifice. E, empathy and emotional intelligence. R, resources and resolve. V, valor and value drive. I is our IQs and entrepreneurship. Whatever we do, don't just do as an entrepreneur to make profit, but as an entrepreneur to profit our society. C, our conduct, because there's always a cause, and E, elevated sight. Today, in a world, in Nigeria, where we have as our head of service, a woman, Mrs. Winifred Ekanem Oyota, let us remember, it's not about the tokenism, it's about the assignment. And one message she has demanded is a message of excellence in service delivery. Access to development opportunities will create community for us. The demand for access for women worldwide, please note, all of these four outlooks are 23-year-old references. I'm not bringing anything from the platform for action of the SDGs from now. 23 years old, from the Wife Isin Project in Beijing. The demand for access for women worldwide is a mandate. It is still a mandate that sits unbalanced with the scale always tilting to a misinterpretation of what women need, want, and deserve. Three distinct things. What do we need? What do we want? Have we articulated it? What do we deserve? Don't mix what we deserve with what is a need. The needs must be properly profiled in our needs assessment reference. What we want, what we're pushing for, our activism must be clearly articulated. We must find voices for voices speaking. Yes, I know, we say voices for the voiceless, but I've realized a lot, or let me just say, a number of voices speaking are not being heard the way they should be heard because the message is not being carried as clearly as it needs to be carried. There is a way in which the tone of a messenger will offend or embrace the listener. A lot of women in active feminism sound angry Proud, rude, confrontational, irate. Nobody is letting her through that gate. And this is the sincere problem. But when a woman becomes wise in her gate, I'm not telling you to go there and seduce, don't do it. By the way, I was number one lead debater. Oh. Queen's Hall, all of us, we, we beat all the guys. Anybody here from my time knows. I beat them from the medical school. We beat them, I think it was Zig Hall, I can't remember. My friend, my friend of uh, blessed memory then, they were the number one debaters. But I grew up 
being trained to moderate. I not only went to the University of Ibadan, I'm also a product of St. Louis Grammar School, Mokola, Ibadan. So, Mokola Ibadan is a great place. Adiola Lubamiji, the number one science and technology reference diaspora in Canada, is the first graduate PhD from the University of Saskatoon. She grew up here in Mokola, selling pepe on her head. One day she'll come and speak at this institute. She's my mentee. We need access based references. You see, access, therefore, must be free of all discrimination and patronization. You can only come this far, get a woman, don't take this seat, um, be nice to me, and you'll get it. Ladies, girls, be warned and beware. Be nice to me and you'll get it. Can create challenges that follow you for life. I have a young mentee just last week, she came to meet me. She wasn't raped, but she was touched in a way that left her feeling violated. By her boss, she thought she had a safe place with him. He is Christian, he is even pastoral. And she went to visit him to discuss matters of the office at nine o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Drove in, parked, and she's a pretty girl. Knock, knock. Hello, sir. And you know, this is your cute thing you do. It confuses. <laughs> I'm being very serious. You are talking to your boss, your prof. Okay. What are you saying? It looks like two messages. Oh, very dangerous. It's that thing you put on selfies and you post on your social media platforms. <laughs> and the guys look at it with your pout and like, oh, let me just... <laughs> <laughs> Stop confusing the language. Our cute looks and all that kind of thing. We've got to know how to package your market. It has challenged so much and exposed too many of us to what we were not looking for because we were so naive to think you can drive into your girl's house at 9 p.m. at night looking so pretty to talk about work issues. How would the man not attempt to kiss you? He's like, no, 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 she's going. She hasn't finished what she came for. Since then, she's had a problem going to work. And guess who got into the problem? Her fiance. She decided to blame him somehow because the power predator, she cannot confront. So she looks at the next most important reference, which is this young man who wants to marry her. You didn't invite him to come with you to go and see Oga. It messes you up. If I'm to start asking a number of us to tell you some of our true stories, I promise you, Sexual abuse have been there. The other issues have also been there. That's another discussion for another day. But messed up and all, I'm still a message. And I'm a messenger. In the place of political and electoral emancipation, the qualification quota placed on women must be lifted. Her humanity qualifies her eligibility. Enough of this thing that you say, a woman, how can she represent me? That's what women say. She's not brilliant enough. She can't even speak the English right. So with your Harvard English and your UI English and all of our status quo, the woman who wants to run for political office because she has not gone to the school you and I have gone to, doesn't speak with the kind of inflection you and I have had the opportunity to groom, is not good enough. But which man looks at the man and says, his English isn't good enough? Humanity is her eligibility. It is therefore an infringement on her electoral right to demand qualifications higher than that of a male counterpart. 
or you in order to run for political office. Access based on qualification is different from access based on equal opportunity. New appraisals, new paradigms must be engaged to closing extant educational, political, and economic gaps. It is also important to note that it is time to change the label of poverty alleviation programs to a wealth creation status quo and liquidate that cliche, poverty alleviation, and the economic profiling of the woman, particularly the African woman. Let us retool her for a new framework of economic dividends through a different reference. Madam Patience, sincerely, I was privileged to be at CSW 62, and I realized that they don't understand seeing someone like me. By the way, I'm dressed like I dress for the office. It's not my fault, it's my favor. It's just the way I was a tomboy, even it's just the way I package to go out, host events and things like that. So I've dressed up the way I dress up to go to work. And it's just an amazing privilege that one can look like that. For all that in my dressing up, I'm particular. I'm not into the 24 karat gold. I must wear this because guess what? As I'm dressed and you're looking at me so beautiful, someone blessed me with it. Another woman who wanted me to encourage her in her business asked me to please come, spend time with her, speak into her business, pray in her business, and then said, please ma, can you take a look at this and that and that? Can you please, I just want to use you as my model. I'm just standing here as a model for another woman's business. And that's who we all are. Stand out for your sister. And so I went and I found out that the language, poverty alleviation, and I said, I'm sorry, do you think you could look at the African woman different? It's not poverty alleviation that is her problem. It's just wealth creation. She knows what to do with sand. It's agriculture. She knows what to do to package her market. She's been doing it for eons. Before there was any kind of economy, she was running the economies of African society. What she needs is what Wafa does. How did you put it? You said helping women to succeed well within your own sphere, succeed in their careers and in their professions. She just needs to understand how to do it better. It was at the UN I learned that there's a, a, a particular community of women that tradition does not allow to go fishing. So it's the men who would always go fishing and bring the fish. So guess what? One woman and two did. They bought a boat. Employed fishermen. Go and bring fish. We sell our fish. We pay you for fishing. Don't worry, we're still on the shoreline. And suddenly, I had an aha moment there. Wow. Traditionally, we say, don't give people fish. Teach them to fish. No, please, don't bother teaching us to fish. Just teach us how to transact and buy boats. Yeah. <laughs> Own the water territories. Own the fish. And pay the fishermen. Reappraising a different paradigm. Wealth creation, not poverty alleviation. Poverty alleviation makes you look at you poor and give you handouts. But when I look at you as wealth creation, I'm not thinking of a handout. I'm not thinking micro enterprise. I'm thinking macro, global. I'm looking at global funding, not a handout alleviation program. In conclusion, the winning serve. Repositioning African women as global service. And that is our bold paradigm call for the now. I came up with this statement when I was preparing this. I've extracted one as a quote, the, West, the rest I'm reading. It's about the power serve. When we aim to lead, we drop. But when we aim to serve, we truly emerge. Not necessarily as first, but as distinct and not necessarily as the best, but as chosen. You see, what this does is if we go with the mentality of I'm going to lead, we become competitive.
But when we go with the mentality, I'm going to serve, we begin to embrace, collaborate, synergize. We begin to work and walk one with the other. I'm not pushing you aside. I'm not trying to thrust myself out in front. I need patience to speak in to me. I wanted patience to help me be preparing this. But when I called and realized she was coming to represent, I said, ah, let me go there and let patience give me my scorecard when I'm done. Let me take it that I'm going for an examination. But she was willing. Auntie Dara was willing. Anna James wrote me a whole with, with, with slides. I just said I wanted some ideas. She wrote me a speech just to help her sister, Dio. Oh, I'm telling you all this because I want you to understand the reality of what is in each of us. You can do for me what I could never do for myself. But I must see myself there. It's not about competitive presentation so I can emerge as a leader. It's about a will to serve, serve your generation. Don't just see yourself as serving in an academia like me, crossover. So many of us in entrepreneurship, in the marketplace, we need your core knowledge resource to help us. I'm a voice. Am I not a voice? If you give me your message, this is what sells me. I'm not a comedian, even though people laugh, I can be humorous. But people, whenever I do a job and I, I host an event, that's how come I'm not an MC, Master of Ceremony. I'm an EC, Enterprise Communicator. And after going to the UN, I said I'm a GEC, Global Enterprise Communicator. <laughs> because what I transact in is the business of taking your message and giving it voice and articulating it I always tell my clients, I'm only as good as you make me look. Make me look good, oh. <laughs> Give me one, two, three points, and I will shoot. Because of courage. So, you may not emerge as the first, but be distinct. If you're best as a student, is not an A star, but you put in your best and you arrived at C. Applaud yourself. For too long, we heard it. Nigerians are pregnant with uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers. Not with sons and daughters that we are growing up into their own space of becoming the best sports analysts. Okay, footballers now, you see why you should have allowed your son to play football? Maybe he would have helped us. <laughs> but like I said, we may have come back this time without son. Has this gift? Send them. We desperately need to win this World Cup again. You may not be first, but be distinct. I've learned more than be distinguished, be distinctive. I could have come here as distinguished senator, this, that, 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 and I'll give you a paper that has been written for me. I don't think you remember it as much as me just being me, like this. Yes? But each one has her lane that she's running. So don't denigrate the distinguished senator who had the audacity to run and win for your constituency. Many of us don't even know our representatives but we find it easy to condemn them. Maybe the conversation they need that will change their own commitment is the one with you. The power of the serve is its drive. A power drive derived from mental alertness, creative perspiration, and innovative audacity. Be audacious in anything you're going to do. Even if you're going to fail, know that you tried with audacity. Beyond what is essential, you must do what is critical. Discover, nurture, and grow your capacity. Grow your capacity. I don't speak like this because I found myself speaking like this. It has grown over time. Have you heard about the 10,000 hour rule? It's 10,000 hours not of rubbish. It's 10,000 hours of very deliberate and intentional commitment to excellence. Excellence is not by chance, it's by choice. Grow your capacity.
capacity. Your retainership capacity is trained and retrained through deliberate force and stimulation of your personal wit, your guts, and your heart. And when you've trained in it long enough, you don't just own it, you want it. My favorite statement is from French philosopher, um, 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 and, 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 he's, and, and what he says is, if he says, Dr. Rosa, he says, if one advances confidently in the direction of his or her dreams, and strives to live the life that he or she has imagined. He or she will meet with success, unexpected in common hours. For all you know, you could be that messed up girl from the University of Ibadan who one day will stand and speak at the Institute of Gender Studies. It can happen. Common hours give you trophies. To get it right, therefore, in my opinion, it's not about repositioning, but about resetting our perception. It is now a challenge of reperception, not reposition. A challenge to reset values, convictions, arguments, and propositions in line with the fresh frontier of opportunities, not frustrations. Please, however we want to position ourselves as women, let's come from the position of embracing opportunity, not reacting, born out of frustration. Choosing gender humanity over gender equality. The first trophy that Serena Williams won was not on July 8, 2002, when she held the Women's Tennis Association number one ranking for 186 consecutive weeks, consistency, tying the record set by Steffi Graf for the most consecutive weeks as number one by a female tennis player. It was the one she gave herself by discovering her winning serve. In her own words, these are Steffi's, I mean, um, um, Serena's words. I was just tired of losing. Life was passing me by. World champion Serena beat fear, race, color, gender, age, even postpartum blues in her most recent feats becoming a mother. It was and is still an intentional journey of self-discovery. It began in her heart, her mind, her thoughts, it was translated to her hands, to her racket, before it became a world record feat, before it became her world acclaimed power serve. And when she discovered it, she discovered the wonder woman in her. She discovered her Wakanda. I therefore do not stand here today as feminist, but as feminine. I do not stand here to propagate the traditional norm of gender equality but to requalify the terms of reference for repositioning the woman in service and development on an equal opportunity matrix of gender equity, where the emphasis is on opportunity and not sex. I'm not here with an intellectual query, but with a proposition, an agenda, proffering a unique selling position for the African woman, which is her unique server proposition, a winning serve of a global server. Africa, African women, we must become intentionally feminine, intentionally political, and intentionally global. Thank you, God bless you. And I will just say this, thank you very much. I'll just, where is it? I'm so sorry to have you standing. I needed to do it, honoring my alma mater. I may not know how to sing it, but I heard you, DVC. Unibado, fountainhead of true learning, deep and sound. Soothing spring for all who thirst, bounds of knowledge to advance. Pledge to serve our cherished goals, self-reliance, unity, that our nation may with pride help to build a world that is truly free. Second verse, unibado, first and best. Raise true minds for a noble cause. Social justice, equal chances, greatness won with honest toil. Guide our people this to know, wisdom's best to serve to turn. Help enshrine the right to learn for a world that knows is the mind.
hands. Once again, African women, let us become intentionally feminine, intentionally political, intentionally global. Thank you. Please, to my people, help me say Wakanda. Now, when I said uh, the conference organizers have been able to go after the person that is most qualified to speak on the issue. Was I wrong? Have we learned anything? Has she set the tone for the conference? Although she was trying to uh, place it as not being fully academic, but our presentation has, has been uh, more of academic arguments and then uh, bringing in the field experience with it, and then you decorate it a little more, and then and then you now spice it all. When you are, when you are not repositioning and you are resetting, and then later you come back to repositioning, and then I begin to wonder, where are we? Please, a round of applause for us. Fantastic presentation, and then I'm beginning to even uh, reset so many things. <laughs> uh, context matters. Women that uh, do more than others are mothers. Uh, it's about equal opportunity. And then I got something about conceptual pluralism of issues of uh, poverty has not been uh, uh, feminized, what they need is uh, uh, that equal uh, opportunity. Um, but one thing that is important that I also got from our presentation is the value and the track she keeps on her network. She does not leave that network of people around her. And you could see everything that she was saying, she would tie it down to this, what she got from this place, she would tie it down to this, and there is always that network of influence. What are we doing to our own? So I think that is a particular important point that I also got uh, from that uh, presentation. Uh, unfortunately, my name is not listed as one of those that will make presentation here. <laughs> so I would just quickly invite uh, Dr. Agada Elachi, who we have kept on that seat to see everything. And I think you are now more positioned <laughs> to give us that chair view of everything now. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. You know, the interesting thing about being the chairman is that you sit on the chair. <laughs> so I have enjoyed sitting on the chair. <laughs> all right. Um, time is fast spent, so I will just acknowledge all the protocols. Uh, but permit me to uh, honor Mama Bolanle uh, Awe, Professor Emeritus. Uh, I, I consider it a great privilege to have had the opportunity to sit beside you. Of course, our chief host, we cannot live without uh, acknowledging our chief host, ably represented by the DVC, uh, Professor Lani Ke Adeyemo. Uh, I better say this because I do not want, you know, when you are, a, D a VC is like a governor, and the university is like a territory. So if you do not pay proper respect, they can close the gate and say you can't go. <laughs> and I need to go back to Abuja. Of course, um, we want to also pay respect to the institute and, of course, the representative of the director of the institute, 
uh, Dr. Jimo, thank you. And then lastly, but not the least, of course, I think before I give my remarks, I need to pay respect to our keynoter. That was a fantastic keynote speech. I think I can say with every sense of responsibility, I haven't had one so exciting in quite a long time. And I don't know how many of you timed her, but she spoke for, I think, one hour, 35 minutes, or there about. <laughs> and, and I didn't see anybody complaining. And I want to again recognize and thank the DVC. Uh, usually, my experience is when you go for functions like this, the official people will leave quietly <laughs> after they perform their role. Thank you, madam, for staying. It shows that you are passionate about this. Now, when I was contacted to chair this conference, which in my humble opinion is a very important one, I wondered what qualified me for such recognition and honor. Whilst I have always believed in gender equity and the promotion and recognition of the rights of the woman and the girl child, my activities have never been public. Indeed, I'm a practicing lawyer, and so one of the things I've done over the years is to do a lot of pro bono work supporting women and in some cases, where the situation demands, fight for the rights of children who have been molested one way or the other, especially sexual molestation. Essentially, my activities have been carried out in my sphere of influence, and as such, I'm confident that this could not have attracted the attention of the organizers. So initially, I thought to myself, Oh, it is because I'm an alumnus of the, not just this great university. Yes, I'm also a UI graduate. But also of this space setting institute. I left here in 2007. I did my master's degree here in 2007. So alas, however, my conversations with Dr. Olutayo revealed that the organizer did not know that I was actually an alumnus of this school. So that could not have been the reason. Next, I thought, okay, maybe somebody discovered that I have five sisters, and as, and as such should be knowledgeable about the issues of gender. <laughs> but again, I, I was certain that they could not have known that I had five sisters. So, lastly, it occurred to me, ah, is it possible that somebody has likened me to Baba? Those of you who can read between the lines, I'm sure you will follow my gift. You know the Baba I'm referring to? Okay. All right. I do not want to be accused of, uh... <laughs> well, whatever the reason or reasons motivated the organizers, I wish to say that I consider it a great honor and a rare privilege to have been invited to chair a conference such as this. This conference has great potentials for social change and, of course, transformation. Our society, especially in light of present realities, challenges and opportunities, will benefit greatly from a conference like this. I'm also happy to be here because, in my view, I'm also a feminist. Or at least I have to, I'm in touch with my feminine side. How many of us men here are in touch with our feminine side? How many of us are not afraid to be men, but recognize that women should be our equal? How many of us? Great. If you, if you have that potential, then of course, if you re read Chief Amanda's book, you are also a feminist. <laughs> now, it is heartwarming to note that the organizers have thought it fit to put together a conference on gender studies. Even though my little inquiries, and I do not claim to be an authority in this area, have indicated that the primary focus of gender studies is the woman, it is instructive that your facilitators and paper presenters are not limited to women. The fact that I'm chairing today is testimony of that fact. It is my humble view that whilst the origin and the rationale for gender studies is predicated on the need to promote studies about the history of the woman, gender studies must also focus on the man. The fact that we have men and women is why we have gender issues in the first place, isn't it? Yes. Okay. We are the other half of the gender equation. I am happy to be a man, but I, while being a man, I must recognize the role that the woman plays in my life. Thus, such study must be about the relations of men and women in the societal context. In today's world, attention and focus must be given to issues bordering on diversity, inclusiveness, and of course, very importantly, gender. The importance of such a study 
and by correlation, a conference of this nature cannot be overemphasized, as there is still some knowledge gap with regards to such studies. Thank God we now have this institute, uh, or rather this gender studies. Of greater importance is the, is the depth of awareness with regards to these issues. What the keynote speaker spoke to this afternoon, I'm sure, even for those of you who are of this uh, um, gender studies program, many of you found them very revealing. That tells you that there is need for more advocacy on issues relating to gender and gender studies. It is commonplace to hear people replace reference to issues relating to gender with feminism. The keynote speaker again touched on that. This is unfortunate. This is an unfortunate misconception. Gender studies are more expansive and encompassing than that. It is about how to make our society function better by ensuring that all units of society work together to provide a sense of belonging to all. Gone are the days when there were limitations to what certain groups or units of society, and in this case I mean women, uh, were permitted or were allowed to do or not to do. Recently, if you followed the news, Saudi women celebrated the lifting of the restriction on driving by women in that country. That was a great achievement. Today's woman is a front runner in all spheres of life, breaking new barriers. Thus, gender studies relate to issues of access to justice, human rights, sexual and domestic violence, cultural orientation and practices, theology and vocation, and in particular, the view that women have of themselves and of their role in the community. I think the keynote speaker underscored this very fact. Other areas of focus are economic empowerment, political participation and emancipation, opportunities in education and related challenges, and we've heard about some of this, equality versus equity. There's a great deal of confusion about these two. They are not the same thing. These are all topical issues which I urge participants to deliberate on, and fortunately the tone for it has been set by the keynote speaker. So, I would like to stop here, since I'm not giving a keynote speech, <laughs> but only a chairman's address. My job is to chair, and chair I will remain at. It is my hope, however, that I have added to the discourse by these few remarks. Once again, I thank you for inviting me to participate in this epoch-making event and for the privilege of service. On that note, I hereby declare the conference open. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, you have actually um, also added to the tone uh, coming from the legal and the human rights uh, perspective to the issue. And uh, I also know that uh, the distinguished scholars and activity, activists that are here, and some of the papers that have also uh, gone through uh, their, their titles, I uh, will touch on these uh, areas that uh, have been raised by speakers. Uh, the students have been very active. Their presence here uh, is not just uh, symbolic. They also have uh, important presentations to make at this conference. Uh, now may I invite students from Valencia College now to make your presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow students. My name is Maria Grace and we are from Valencia College and we want to present a little drama which talks about the which talks about the fight against female the fight against um, discrimination of female in politics and we we'll call on our contestants who want to present their manifestos. We call on Honorable Adek Bridges Stone.
I just wonder what this thing is doing here. Don't you know that this election is for competent men, people with great potentials and ability? Anyways, good morning, my fellow citizens. I am Honorable Adrigo J. Stoney. I'm here to contest for the governorship election for this great state, or your state, the face of that state. I'm here to present my manifesto. Um, if you vote for me as the governor of this state, you know this issue about the Fulani Edsmen that they are destroying lives and properties. I'll make sure that this issue is truncated and abolished. <laughs> also, we know that foundation is the bedrock. Is the bedrock. Therefore, when I'm elected as the governor of this great state, I will make sure that there is free education from the primary level to the tertiary level. Training, erudite, and people with great potentials. Finally, when I'm elected as governor of this great state, I will ensure and make sure that Oyo State sets a pace for other states, making sure that there are people of great possibilities, people of great potentials who can take Oyo State to a better level. Thank you. So we call on Honorable Barista Selma Wayidili. Good morning, my fellow Nigerians. My name is Honorable Barista Samuel Adeoye. I'm here to present my manifesto to you today to make you see the reasons why it's a great idea for you to vote me as the governor of Oyo State. If I am voted in as the governor of Oyo State, I will solve the problems and challenges that the government of today, of Oyo State, have been facing for the past two years. I will provide free education for everybody in the states and as, reason, as reasonable Nigerians, I expect you to vote me the man over the woman who has effective, effective potentials of dealing with the business of politics in our states. I urge you to vote for me today as the governor of Oyo State. I will never let you down. Thank you. So, call on Chief Dr. Okuno. Good day, fellow Nigerians. I am Chief Dr. Kunowo, a worldwide known businessman. I'm a worldwide known businessman, and I'm here to contest for the post of the governor of this great state. If I am voted in as governor, I intend to pursue the following as my goals. Firstly, if I am voted in as the governor of this state, I will make sure there is free education and free food for everyone in this state. Also, if I am voted in as the governor of this state, I'll make sure that there are enough social amenities to cater for the needs of the people. Also, if I am voted in as the governor of this state, I'll make sure the state is developed and taken to a place of high care. Lastly, I wonder what the woman is doing here because the last time I checked, this was not a cooking competition. This is a political activity where men are supposed to be here and I wonder what she's doing here. So I hope you vote for me. Thank you. We call the only woman in our midst, Honorable Favor Odiawa. Aren't we tired? Children on the street begging, unfulfilled promises made to us about them. Great people of the community, can you give me three books out? Bosa! 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 Thank you. As you all know, my name is Honorable Victoria Odiawa. I'm aspiring to be the governor of this great state. If I become the governor of this great state, I will ensure education. Our men are making promises of free education. We are seeing children on the street begging. In the background, that's called my meter. The rate of children on the street begging is much. And saying they are making promises of education. They are nothing to show for it. Women, aren't we tired of this at home? Showing nothing to do, doing nothing, no productive, unfulfilled promises made to us, sitting down, doing nothing, not looking? No. We are going to stand up and say, what a man can do, a woman can do better. As you can know, how the former commissioner of women affairs, I go to foreign camps to check out people and our men are telling us I'm not competent to be that. If you go around the world, you see women. If you, let me remind you guys that Nigeria is referred to be a her, a female. So do not just say I'm not, I don't have the, the ability to become the governor of this great state. If I'm the governor of this great state, I'll ensure that things, women are have Women will have the opportunity to show themselves, show what we are made of, show what God has made us. Because He has made us beautiful and 
wonderfully made. So well good to show. Thank you very much. <laughs> It is often said that politics is a man's game, that a woman's walk is in the kitchen. Good day, everyone. I'm Asad Baijiro again from Valencia College. Yeah. What you just watched was a glimpse of the injustice of politics against women. It is sad that in this new age, in this so-called advanced democracies, that women are still marginalized. It is unfortunate that the fact that we are in the 21st century has not changed anything. Women should not be limited to the kitchen alone. They should not be limited to just taking care of children. They should have the right and capacity to also contest and rule. The women run the home so they can run a society with ease. I believe that it's safe to say, due to the present condition of both the state and the country, that a woman should be given the right that a man has to be able to rule this country as well. If all human beings are born equal, why should some be more equal than others? Beside every successful one, there is a woman. That is why I say that women should stand up today for what they believe in, for what they can do, always. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, we all got the message. We are still waiting for the presentation and uh, I'm more interested in the aspect of cutting the cake uh, so I can uh, take my. Okay, um, I've been. Uh, Asked to powerfully invite uh, the representative of the director, uh, Dr. Jimo, to join them in the presentation of the class. Good afternoon, everybody. Standing on already existing protocol, I will say good afternoon once again. Please, I would like to invite Mrs. Dio Benjamin Lani. Please, I don't know about for us to come forward. Thank you very much for our participation for me. And those who are here, very spiteful. Thank you very much for this. Um, the next person I have is Dr. Agatha Elachi. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you for coming. We love you. of blacks also uh, resonates what they, they were saying uh, they the been saying since morning and when the lady was uh, presenting to the to the ladies the presentation was fantastic and uh, insightful but when she wanted to present to the the man we love you <laughs> <laughs> so you could see how it has become something that has been internalized and so it would take uh, what uh, the key not present as said, the, the anointing oil to remove uh, some of those things. Um, I think before the vote of thanks, uh, which would be delivered by uh, Mrs. Modupe Ala. Uh, let me invite uh, the representative of uh, Dr. Maria Martin to quickly make a presentation. Thank you. 
the representative of Dr. Maria Martins. Good afternoon, sirs and mats. My name is Tim Tobadibui, and I will be presenting a speech put together by Dr. Martins to commemorate this occasion. Dr. Martins is a PhD holder in African and Amer African American Studies, Fulbright Hayes Doctorate Dissertation, Research Abroad Fellow, Bill and Melinda Gates Millennium Alumna, Professor in University of California. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to put African women in their proper place. They have contributed in no small way to development in their respective countries through various forms of services, but they, are still, but they still do not receive the recognition they deserve. In order to demonstrate this point, I would like to share a story derived from historical research in the KODK archives. On August 14, 1964, Constance Cummins joined a female nationalist leader of Sierra Leone penned a letter to Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, a Nigerian nationalist. Cummins John called her, my dear Fumi, and said, you have done so much for African womanhood. You have labored to lift her heads up, but you have done so obstructively and without any honor or recognition. Someday Nigerian will feel your worth when the history of Nigeria is properly written and publicized. Cummins John expressed this when the history of Kumis John expressed this sentiment that women like Mrs. Kuti at that time had not received the acknowledgement that they deserved for their activism in African nations. She spoke to three important topics in this portion of the letter. African women's activism, the worth of women to nation, and the proper retelling of national narrative. My friends, we must, we must shape the proper retelling of the narrative of nation, recognizing women for their contributions as well. Kumis John cited the unrecognized work of Mrs. Kuti to support the idea that African women's work towards gender equality constituted a pivotal part of and had noteworthy impact on the holistic development of nation of Nigeria. This short excerpt from the letter speaks volumes to me. But Mrs. Kumis John's word overwhelmingly make me think of the fierce urgency of now and the necessity of practical action. When Mrs. Kuti realized that women collectively were suffering economically, socially, and politically under colonialism, she acted in the fierce urgency of now and immediately went to work founding community-based campaigns and organizations for women's development that cut across ethnic, religion, gender, and class lines. In doing this, she brought together women and like-minded men from all levels of the society to work towards common goals. This coming together of people from all social strata and the movement and philosophy that developed from women's progress and national development exhibited the necessity of practical action. Mrs. Kuti initiatives bridged the gap between the elite and working class community women. The same type of practical actions bridged the, bridged the gap in the necessity in the fierce urgency of now that African women face currently. As scholars and intellectual, we must realize the necessity of practical action and find ways to bridge the gap between the academy and the community. We must create more dialogue between scholars and community-based advocates and collaborate on similar issues and common interests we hold. So I would like to face, to leave with you with this question. How will you embrace the necessity of practical action in the fierce urgency of now? This inaugural conference of the Gender Studies Program and Wafira invites scholars public intellectuals, activists, students, professionals, in order to further analyze women's contribution to development through service in an effort to critically analyze the meaningfulness of their work and the issues they experience in service of their countries. When this is done, it will facilitate more relevant conversations and planning for a way forward that we address persistent issues in gender and development. Amor Remy, this is the importance of gender studies. This conference is a way of taking a practical step to start important conversation between academia and community. What will you do to address the necessity of practical action in the fierce urgency of now? It is my hope that you support gender studies in any way you can. Now, Professor Pei Eshe Goni, 
mo dupe lowo olorun fun igba ti mo fi se idanile ko lodo yin e ku igbadun please enjoy the conference thank you very much awon na fe so pe e se so with that i think um we should cut the cake and then the vote of thanks uh I want to say to God be the glory and uh, a big congratulations to uh, my supervisor, my friend, my family, Mrs. Dr. Olutayo. Congratulations to you for this occasion. Um, I know that uh, a lot of different names have been given to repositioning. Uh, I will still stand on that repositioning. And when I say R, I want everybody to pronounce that, what that R stands for, for me. R. W. I. S. A. And D. In Jesus' name. So I should just cut the thing and eat. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's the simplest uh, form of uh, cutting the cake. And this leaves me with uh, the hope. Okay. I think at this point there will be an intervention. We need to reposition. Please, could we have this cake here? Thank you. Um, Mommy Kalejai, please could you come forward? Please could our coordinator from the Gender Institute also come forward? Dr. Shemulutayo, please could you please come this way? Thank you very much. Please, I'd like to respectfully ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just like that. Okay. Ebatam in your way To the right, to the left. Thank you very much. Um, please, could we have our guests please come this way? Now you see where I stepped into it based on my, my job. Thank you. Can still move forward. We can still move forward because we have one row down behind. Where's the knife? Very important. We position the knife right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. So we will take that count with the R W S A D. Um, please, could we have? Yes, thank you, Mr. Kioba, um, Dr. Jimor, um, Mr. Kosa, yes, my chairman. And of course, we will have mommy. I know mommy can join us quickly. Please, where is? There's something we're going to have to do about Dr. Olutayo and the way in which she likes to melt into obscurity. Um, because this, thank you very much. My gentleman, thank you very much. Any more of my speakers here? Okay, I'd like to ask um, Kevi to join us. Madam Munua Kevi. Mommy. No, mommy has stayed. No, bye, mommy. Mommy has stayed. Okay. Thank you. So now, thank you very much. My chairman. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Okay, so where does Keynote stay now? <laughs> you okay, okay. I'm there. I'm here. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. All right. Look at And now, since we are properly repositioned, we will now start. When I say R, you tell me what it goes for. R. Repositioned. W. Women. I. In. S. Service. A, A, and, and, and D, development. Now, slice my share. Now, uh, that's done, and you could see uh, the the multiple roles 
e que que não te apresenta a perform and I'm sure uh, she's still going to do more uh, until she leaves this place. <laughs> so now let me invite uh, the person who will do the vote of thanks and thank all of us, Mrs. Mudupe Hala. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I remember the story of a man who once came late from his outings to the house, and then um, the wife was still waiting, and then um, asked him if he would still like to have anything at that time of the night. And the man said, just give me something light. <laughs> And the woman asked, what, what, what is like? And he said, Eva will be okay. <laughs> I'm sure most people that are not gender sensitive would have imagined that we have come for something light. But from all that we have seen and heard, you will agree with me that this is not something like this. <laughs> Even beyond ever. Beyond ever. I want to thank you all for being here. I am most grateful to the Gender Studies Department because it has really impacted my life. I will say I happen to be the first person that got to know about this department and the first person that registered. And I'm going to be the first person that will graduate with PhD in this department. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, we thank God for the success of this international, first of its kind, the International Conference of the Gender Studies Program and WAFIRA 2018 the theme, repositioning women in service and development. We want to show our appreciation to the presence of Mama in our midst, Mama Bolanle Awe. Thank you very much, Ma, for coming. We appreciate you. Ekwe Fuwama. We want to also appreciate the Vice Chancellor, University of Ibadan in the person of Professor Abel Idowu Olayinka, every represented by the DVC Reeds, Professor Olayinka Adeyemo. Thank you very much, Ma. We appreciate your presence. We would also like to appreciate uh, the DVC admin, the DVC academic, who were unably absent. We appreciate them for their support. We appreciate the director of the Institute of African Studies, Professor Pogosin, ably represented by Dr. Jimo, also from the Institute of African Studies. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much for your support. Um, we would like to appreciate all the lecturers from the Institute of African Studies. They have really supported the gender unit of the Institute. God bless you all. We appreciate you. Now I want to appreciate our chairman, the chairman of Alternative Dispute Resolution, Nasima. We thank you very much, sir, for your coming. God bless you. Um, we would like to appreciate the UN representative of Nigeria and ECOWAS, ably represented by, I mean, sorry, the UN representative of Nigeria and ECOWAS, Madam Comfort Lamte, ably represented by Mrs. Patience Ekeoba. Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate you. We want to say a very big thank you to our elegant keynote speaker. 
In fact, she, she did justice to the team. We want to say we thank you, Ma, and we appreciate you. More of that in Jesus' name. Mrs. Dio, Benjamin's learning. Thank you very much for coming, Ma. She is the managing director of Dogza Digital Abuja. She took us through a reperception re re of women in service and development. Not just repositioning, but reperceptioning. Thank you very much for that education, man. We appreciate it. We also We also would like to appreciate Dr. James, who came from, um, on behalf of JDPC. We thank you very much, sir, for that presentation. We cannot but appreciate our own sister, who is collaborating with us in Gender Unit, Mrs. Kemi Ayemu. She said so much on rape, and uh, we all would stand up to that task. There's a tendency to want to, you know, wrongly assume that some people do not need to be appreciated, especially when they are so involved in an event. But this afternoon is not going to be like that. I would like to appreciate our coordinator in gender studies and the person of Dr. Sheufomi Olutaye. She has been a wonderful mentor. Thank you very much, Ma. We appreciate you. We also want to appreciate the coordinator of Wafira uh, in the person of Mrs. Hannah Slingma. She has been a strong supporter to the Gender Studies Unit. We appreciate you, Ma. Our appreciation goes to the managing director of BOVAS, Mrs. Victoria Samson, ably represented by Mr. Tenetope Samson. We appreciate that support that you gave. God bless you, sir. Our appreciation goes to the various people that have contributed financially to the success of this program. We say a very big thank you to you all, but above all, we pray that God will thank you on our behalf in Jesus' name. Amen. We appreciate all our invited guests from other institutions and other departments in the University of Ibadan. We thank our, our MC, Dr. Tade Ulutayo. We say thank you very much for your job well done. Although they have gone, but we still have some of them around. We don't want to downplay their presence. We want to appreciate all the sons and daughters from the different schools that have come to grace this occasion. You will excel in all your endeavors. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I almost uh, forgot that crucial, in fact, critical part of the program. Because without them, we will probably not be seated here since 9 o'clock up till this time. They have done a wonderful job, all of them put together. But on behalf of all of them, I want to say a very big thank you to Mrs. Helen Akpabio. Please, a round of applause for her. And all the members of the committee that worked with her. We appreciate you, and we say beyond this one, you will do more for the Institute. Thank you very much. We pray that as you all go back to your various homes, God will grant you joining mercy in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, as, as, um, thank you for thanking us.